May it please the court. Good morning, your honors. My name is Tom Valdez, and I represent the petitioner in this case, or the petitioners in this case, Carpenters Home Estate and HMS of Lakeland. We're here today to request that the court exercise its certiorari jurisdiction to quash an order that improperly granted the respondent leave to amend her complaint to add a claim for punitive damages. Certiorari relief is warranted in this case because the procedure employed by the trial court was not the procedure required by section four. I think your argument's pretty straightforward. Yes, your honor. And the point that concerns me that I'd like to just have you address briefly, I know you've addressed it in your filings, but talk to me a little bit about why this wasn't waived. Of course, your honor. The reason why this wasn't waived is because when the trial court, we take a look at the hearing transcript. Yeah, I've read the transcript, so let me just cue you in on that. Right, and following that from beginning to end, what we see is that the trial judge said that he had a certain way of doing things when it came to punitive damages, a way that we take issue with. Right, and he lays it out, that I want to determine if there's even a level of evidence that would allow you to plead, and then I'll worry about who might be liable later. And there's a point in the record where counsel for my client says okay, without elaborating. And respectfully, I think that okay was an acknowledgment of what the court was saying, not an agreement with it. And you find as the hearing goes on and as the argument goes on, that certainly the position taken by my colleague on behalf of our clients is not one that is at all in agreement with the court's, the procedure that the court suggested. When I first read this transcript, I wasn't sure exactly what- Well, you know, it's just a little, it's a little troubling to me, because the court really laid out, here's what I like to do, here's my procedure. I like to do it because I don't have to think about who's liable if I find that there isn't sufficient evidence to warrant punitive damages. And then he transitions into a discussion about, okay, now we've got this new statute. Talk to me about that. Is there any case law? Tell me about the new statute. Well, he does, he certainly does say that, Your Honor. He certainly does outline that. But I think that when the, as the argument progresses in the record, you see that my colleague is at no point acquiescing to the procedure that the court is saying that it wants to employ. In fact, right up until the end, the court is saying, look, there are actually, and the court kind of steps back for a second and said, look, there are a couple of things I can do here. I can deny this with leave to allow the opposing party to come back later on without prejudice. You know, I can, you know, there are a number of things I can do. That's the key one. And my colleague argues, you know, certainly that that's the one that should be employed. That's where all of his argument is focused. And so the passing okay, the passing acknowledgement of what the court is saying about its usual process was not a waiver. It was not an acquiescence to the procedure that the court suggested. My colleague, my colleague went on to argue pretty strenuously that what should happen here is that the court should, you know, at a minimum, the court should deny this motion until a further, you know, until a point in the future. Because as the court pointed out, the court said, look, it's early on here. And based on this evidence, I'm really not, you know, I'm not seeing the nexus, for lack of a better term. And my colleague, I mean, kind of jumped on that and said, you're right, Judge, there is no nexus. There is no nexus here. You can't, you can't allow for what several courts have characterized as a game changer. And that is granting a motion like this and allowing the financial discovery, the very highly intrusive and burdensome financial discovery that comes along with it. You can't allow that kind of a game changer without following 
the procedure. And so I don't think at any point my colleague waived argument in opposition to this. I don't think at any point that he acquiesced in that. And I think that his argument as things went on, and even the trial court's comments as things proceeded at the hearing saying, look, there are a couple of different things I could do. The trial court's responding to my colleague's argument. He's not saying, I'm going to follow my usual practice and I'm just going to go ahead and grant this. He's saying, well, based on your argument, counsel, there are a couple of different things I could do. What the court ended up doing is granting the motion, even though there was never, the plaintiff failed to establish via their proffer any nexus between the punitive conduct and either of the defendants, either of the petitioners in this case. And as we said in our brief, this is a situation that happens really all too often. And the trial court recognized and said, in some cases, I've got seven, eight defendants. I've got boxes of paper. There's no way to get around that or to get around that. And I think there are a lot of circuit court judges in the state that are faced with the same problem. And we certainly applaud the trial court for having the courage to come out and say, look, this is a problem. And so here's how I try and handle that. And in fact, we kind of hate to have to come in and say at the end of the day, despite agreeing with you three quarters of the way, judge, we think you made the wrong decision here. We think you should have denied this without prejudice to allow them to come back and that you shouldn't have granted the motion until such time as they established a nexus between the punitive conduct that you believe the proffer establishes and the two petitioners that we're dealing with here. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. And so at the end of the day, Your Honors, our position, as you mentioned, Judge Kelly, is pretty straightforward. We think that the failure to follow the procedure here, which is outlined in the court's order, it's on the face of the court's order, it's discussed in the transcript, was a departure from the essential requirements of law. And given the game-changing nature of the grant of this type of motion and the discovery that comes with it, there's definitely harm that cannot be remedied unless it's remedied by this court at this point. And for those reasons, we would ask the court to grant our petition and I'll reserve any time I may have remaining for a brief rebuttal. All right. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Jim Wilkes. Florida Rule of Civil Procedure 1190F, 2003, provides a procedure for providing a court with information necessary to have the court allow an amendment to pleading to allow punitive damages. In reading the transcript, there was never any objection that I could find anyone. I'm sorry, can you speak a little bit more loudly? Yeah, my hearing aids aren't working. I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm afraid they're blocking my hearing rather than helping. In reading the transcript, there was an initial objection to the miscibility of the surveys and reference of the expert to the surveys. And Mr. Connell raised that as his point and it was raised by Mr. Delgado that there were no surveys relied upon. Right, right. So that was the only objection. But the trial court in its order didn't make the determination that's required by the statute. You agree with that, correct? No, I do not. Okay, then can you direct me where in the order the trial court made the statutorily required finding regarding vicarious liability? Vicarious liability doesn't have to. This court's decided that. In Amy v. Ruddock, the licensee is automatically liable without more. I don't believe that's what the statute requires. This court in two cases. First, in Amy v. Ruddock case involved a nursing home 
and the question was whether the nursing home could be held vicariously liable for punitive damages, and the statute was interpreted that it could. In fact, it would yeah, have no, to I, be. I, I, I know that. And thereafter. But the statute, the, the 2014 amendment requires a certain showing by clear and convincing evidence before you can amend to add the claim for punitive damages. And, and not only does it require a showing of the facts that rise to the level that would warrant punitive damages, but if you're seeking to hold someone vicariously liable, you also have to meet the, uh, the requirement of clearing and convincing evidence that they um, were, I can't remember the language of the statute, but that they, they were aware of it or but if I can know, forgive me, I don't remember the language of the statute, but, but it requires a showing with respect to the party you're seeking to hold vicariously liable. There's two problems with that. First is the statute's unconstitutional. Okay, but okay. that's not in front of us, so we're just... It, it, it is raised in the brief. Yes, it is. It's in front of you. We've raised the unconstitutionality of the statute in the brief. Um, and the, the second issue is that we didn't get... the. the opportunity I might have liked, uh, we've attempted to take this to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said uh, they didn't want to do it in the um, uh, abstract. They wanted to see it in a real case. So we presented a proffer to the court uh, that included the records. Now, their argument was that the records weren't authentic. I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to now. There's been an appeal that was filed okay, in the... Can we stick to the record in this case? Yes, okay, and the record in this case was the judge made a finding, an aggregate finding, at the end of the presentation of the evidence. Uh, and the only objection to the evidence was the surveys. Yeah, I didn't recall any argument to the trial court about the constitutionality of the statute. I, I the, the judge asked, he says, has anybody interpreted the statute yet? Right. And, and um, uh, Mr. Canal said no one has interpreted the statute in no court. Uh, in reality, I believe the Florida Supreme Court has ruled that the statute uh, can be challenged, but it would have to be challenged in the, a real case such as this. If, for instance, they had said, we object to the presentation of Ms. O'Hai's um, uh, uh, proffer, um, her expert report, which the court relied upon, um, uh, we would uh, demand that the court have her present uh, and have a trial here. Um, we would have objected, and that could have been resolved, and then that might issue be before this court. But in this case, they chose not to do that. They objected, and they made an argument on the surveys and her reliance upon the surveys. And the second thing was they said some of the records might be inadmissible. Uh, they made an, a, a, a global statement, and they did it through a motion to strike. And the court said, we'll defer that, and they said, okay. Uh, so they accepted that. As to the nursing home, the finding, regardless of who's at fault, whether it was the management company or not, the nursing home would be liable and is liable for vicarious punitive damages under the NME versus Reddit case, this, this court. Um, the Norma Johnson case also says that a nursing home has a non-delegable duty under any circumstance to anyone, regardless of it being employee or independent contractor. Uh, but this court did something that I thought was uh, actually intuitive. Um, uh, he stated that um, these cases usually involve multiple LLCs and laborers to, to go through, and that's what the statute was designed to address, was the passive uh, investor versus the active operator, and, and the 214 um, statute. Uh, the, the court asked about it, and it was volunteered by Mr. Berlinke, he said that this is not one of those cases, Your Honor. This is not that kind of case. Uh, I would point out to you that if it was considered a problem, we wouldn't have one attorney here defending a not-for-profit that we only nearly think would be adverse to the management company, but there, it, we've got one attorney handling the appeal for both entities here, and clearly there's no question that the nursing home would be liable under the, the, the statute. But the court recognized that they're, they're inextricably intertwined, and he pointed out these facts. Um, the, the, the sufficiency of the evidence can be challenged, but not here. Well, I don't think that's what they're challenging. I think they're challenging that the trial court failed to make the statutorily required findings necessary for vicarious liability. 
court did not fail to make a statutory required finding. This court made a statutory required finding. It reviewed the evidence that was presented. There was no objection during the presentation of the evidence. The court wrote an order, and he went through and he enumerated, and he aggregated the facts and said there wasn't any one thing that would rise to the level of punitives in his estimation, but that the aggregation clearly met the standard. And that's what the requirement is. Had the witness been present and testified at the hearing, I don't think there would be any discussion. The problem is we're having an argument on the 2014 amendment, 237, which is unconstitutional, which violates the Florida Rule of Civil Procedure. The Supreme Court would have to decide whether that statute is appropriate, whether one would have to sue somebody first before you could sue them. If you read the statute closely, there's never been a case in Florida that has sustained such a statute. But regardless, in this case, it was not objected to. The evidence was presented. The arguments were made, and they withdrew the primary issue. They anticipated a presentation of surveys that they felt would not be admissible. Those were withdrawn, and there was no discussion. If the court reads through, as they went through the analysis of the report and the nursing home records, there was no objections made there, and the court did what he's supposed to do. He looked at the aggregation. He looked at the injuries. He looked at the conduct that was behind the injuries, and he took those together and made his determination. There's a death penalty case where an expert testified, an emergency room physician, that a child was abused and neglected, and the lady was sentenced to death, Ms. Ada Carmona. The Supreme Court felt that was sufficient. That conclusory summary by the expert was sufficient to support a death sentence. She later, on other grounds, remanded to life in prison. Under this set of circumstances, the argument is solely directed to the sufficiency of the evidence and whether this is a punitive case or not. The procedure was followed as its rules require. The statute does not have a procedure, and it's not up to the legislature to tell the courts what their procedures are to be. But you just said the statute doesn't have a procedure. Excuse me? You just said that the statute doesn't require a procedure. The statute cannot require a procedure. Right, and you said it didn't. It doesn't. Okay. The rule of procedure, Rule 1190F, was met. We met it clearly, squarely, right on the nose, it was met, and that's what was required. If the Supreme Court were to come in and adopt a rule that says you're to have a hearing, an evidentiary hearing, where you present witnesses and people come into court and we have a plenary trial, we would have another issue then with access to courts because it would mean you'd have to try cases against people that aren't parties to a lawsuit. But the statute's more encompassing than just punitives. The punitive part hasn't really changed that much other than the argument of admissible evidence. As the court said, what's admissible at the pre-printing stage? I've read that in the transcript. And I think the court squarely addressed the issue of how do you determine what's admissible at a trial before the trial. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think we understand your position. Thank you. Brief rebuttal, Your Honors. The trial court, based on the evidence that was proffered, did make a finding that there was a reasonable basis to believe there was punitive conduct here. However, there's no place in the order or in the transcript where the trial court made an affirmative finding that there was a reasonable basis to allow respondents to add a punitive damages claim against either of the petitioners. The court just did not make the requisite affirmative finding of a nexus between the punitive conduct and the petitioners. And for those reasons, we would request that the court exercise its certiorari jurisdiction, grant a writ of certiorari in this case, and provide further guidance for the bar and the parties in this state regarding the process at issue in this case. Thank you. Thank you.